Guys, welcome to another episode of The Pulse. I'm excited as I always am to talk to people who are doing cool things, making a difference, and agreeing to share their story with us. We've got an award-winning comedian, we've got actor, we've got author, we've got activist, all rolled into one, celebrating 40 years of comedy. It is our pleasure to welcome Margaret Cho to The Pulse. Thank you. You've been involved in a lot of things over the course of a career. So let's let's backpedal as, you know, I guess as close to the beginning as we can. How did you start this? How did you know this? you wanted this to be a career? I've always wanted to be a comedian. As soon as I understood what the job was, I really, uh, I think, formed fully exactly what I wanted when I was about eight years old and then just continued to develop it over the next however many years. But yeah, the, um, the job of it has always been exactly what I wanted. Like after I decided, oh, I'm probably not going to be Wonder Woman. <laughs> so I need to think of another plan. It's kind of childhood aspirations, but it sort of went, went way into adulthood. It's still going on. And I'm still really in, enamored with the profession of it. So I've always wanted to do this. Um, you know, I got my start very early. Uh, I started doing my first performances at the age of 14. And I've never stopped. So it's legitimately been 41 years now. So in the early stages, it was Wonder Woman or comedy. This whole Wonder Woman thing's not going to work out. So comedy was a plan B. Yes, plan B. <laughs> so very young, you knew you wanted to do comedy. You And I'm reading that there was, a, I guess it's the break or a break that you won a contest. Yes, uh, I was in a comedy contest for college comedians, which I was not in college. I was still high school age, but I lied. And I got in and I won one of the, uh, they had a West Coast, Midwest, East Coast. So I uh, won. The other winners were also very young, like myself. They were a little older. They were in college. But um, was uh, John DiMaggio, who is a, the, the many voices, very, very familiar voice actor, most, most famously from Futurama. Hmm. And... Um, uh, John Glazer, who uh, is a very famous comedian, actor, did many TV shows. He's also a voice actor, lots of things. Um, I'm in a band with him sometimes. But yeah, we all got to open for Jerry Seinfeld. And uh, this was in the 80s. In so, high school. Um, well, I was not, I was sort of dropped out. So, <laughs> sort of, sort of. <laughs> so, but I was high still school like, age. Yeah, high school age, but I was still able to do this. And, you know, Jerry Seinfeld took me aside and said, you know, if you continue to pursue this, you will have a very successful career. Wow. And I, I thought, wow, what a great vote of confidence. And he's still a friend, um, still a, a, an incredible uh, ally and uh, helps helps me a lot. He's a great guy. And so I'm you know, really indebted to him and to the business of comedy. When you're, you're moving on, you're starting this career, you're doing it as a young person. Did you even in your dreams and imagination think it could get to this? I never knew what to expect. I always wanted to do this. And even just the action of getting on stage anywhere and getting to do this is really amazing. But I've really been amazed at the success that I have achieved. But also, again, it's this being a comedian is the most humbling profession because it doesn't matter how successful you have been in the past. You're still faced with the reality of every time you go and do it again, you have to be great. And an audience isn't going to settle for anything less than that, you know, uh, and your sort of previous successes only buy you maybe about 15 seconds of an audience's time before you have to really deliver. And, you know, sometimes it doesn't go very well. Usually it does. Usually it's amazing. But, you know, when you're trying to do new things, and I'm always trying to uh, figure out the equation of stand-up comedy. I'm trying to figure out the so science of it. Um, we're always trying to tinker with it. And so that doesn't always go up the best. But 
you know, I, I think it, it's always in service of the greater goal is to sort of have a lifetime in this and have some longevity and a legacy. I think you can check that off the box. Like you've had some longevity in this and success and certainly a legacy. But when I started off and was introducing you with all of the, the different achievements, uh, one of them was activist. Was it always the, I have to use my comedy to speak up for what I think is right, use my comedy to take on these kind of challenging topics? Or was there a point that that kind of evolved and you said, I, I have to use my voice this way? Well, it's more the circumstances in which I emerged as a comedian, because I, I started to really become um, uh, much more involved in comedy when um, the AIDS crisis was hitting San Francisco. So I was doing a lot of shows that were fundraisers uh, for people living with AIDS and HIV. And uh, being an activist within those circles really developed me as a comedian, because that was what the majority of work that I was doing was in gay bars, in gay establishments, in gay uh, events that were specifically there to raise awareness about AIDS. And, you know, even when I was much younger, my parents owned a gay bookstore and a, a lot of the employees were the early followers of Harvey Milk. And to have been around to witness his rise and then uh, the terrible devastation of his assassination was um, really what forged my uh, interest and desire to be involved in politics in the way that I have been, you know, activism throughout the years. Yeah, I was reading a review and it was, you're willing to go after all the isms. You know, you've talked on racism, sexism, you've talked about the phobias, like all of the things that are out there, which puts you in controversial territory. Um, has that been, I mean, I guess that's been fulfilling because you keep doing it for 41 years. Yeah, but it's also, to me, it's not controversial to want to have equal rights for everyone. Shouldn't you know, be. It's not, it's, it's not controversial to want women to have rights over their own bodies. It's not controversial to want to allow people to transition, you know, and to be supported mm -hmm. in that transition. So I think... Uh, for me, all of these issues are very uh, basic to what being American is, you know, to have equal rights and freedom for all. Coming up next, is it true story that like, you had people who were telling you you weren't Asian enough? The idea that we're so foreign or so alien that we might need consultants was really misguided. What are we going to see in Margaret Cho Live and Livid? I wanted to do a show that was like really celebrating all of this time doing comedy, but also talk about like protecting drag queens, protecting like queer rights, protecting trans people, you know, from this bizarre evangelical Christian right who are trying to take away all of our rights. You know who wouldn't like what they're saying? Christ. Right. Christ would not be down with any of this. You know, like, if, if I'm also, like, very well-versed in Christianity. I am a former Sunday school teacher. So I used to teach the Bible to children. So I know what I'm talking about when I'm talking about Christ. And Christ would not be, Christ would disagree. So I have a lot of material that's really around that, talking about that. Um, also, reinforcing the need for women's rights, women's rights over our own bodies. You know, this is a very important thing to me. Um, also talking about all of the anti-Asian hate crimes that were happening during COVID. So there's a lot to be livid about, but also celebrating, performing live, being able to do so after a long period of being locked down as we were during the pandemic. So I'm really grateful to be out on the, on the, on the road again, out on the town again. This sounds like it's, it's catharsis for you. Yeah, which is really important. And, you know, I really am so grateful that I get to do it and I get to be doing this for so long. So it's a celebration. So you had the show. You were doing All American Girl. Is it a true story that like, you had people who were telling you you weren't Asian enough, were telling you yes. you were too Asian? They hired right. a coach to teach you how to be more Asian? Yes, they were trying to help us, like, because the idea of being 
Asian was so foreign. Like, in the same way that, you know, a show that was popular at the time, um, Third Rock from the Sun, they had a lot of consultants from uh, astronomy departments and all these science organizations to talk about, like, what it might be like to live on Earth as an alien. So in the same way, we had people from the universities who were very, very well versed in Asian culture to come and help us be more Korean because it was like this thing of we're so out there. We were the first Asian American family on TV. So there, this must be, they must be super different. I mean, I appreciate the care around it. Like, cause they were trying to do something different. Like they were trying to expand this idea of what is a television family about? Who are they? But uh, the, idea that we're so foreign or so alien that we might need consultants was really misguided. And I, I can't imagine somebody, somebody who I'm guessing not Asian, or maybe they were, um, I can't imagine somebody calling me into an office and going, look, Bill, like we, we love the things that you're doing, you know, but we hired so-and-so to teach you how to be more black. Because they're just like so... Uh, wondering like oh where we, are we going to do the right thing are we doing the right thing like so afraid of the possibility of doing something wrong racial experience is told by the person who's experiencing it no matter what i mean our experience is in our skin we should know it by heart because that's who we are so it's weird to have somebody have to reinforce that with a uh some kind of de degree, yeah, consultant. <laughs> well, and that goes back into that category of these things shouldn't be necessary or shouldn't be controversial. And you kind of look at it and you're like, wow. Like somebody not mm -hmm. only thought that, but they felt comfortable doing it. It's weird. But then to look back on that and think, well, that was the time where like they just didn't have any Asian representation on television at all, at all. You know, and so it was very new and oddly wanting to try to do the right thing, it's weird. Coming up next on The Pulse, I appreciate you taking this much time and I appreciate your dog for allowing us to have this much time <laughs> with you. Um, She's giving you a signal like, you know, I need to go, go outside. Yeah. Just for the record, I'm gonna speak on behalf of all the people who were watching, your dog sitting right over your shoulder, participating in the interview and like, I got your back, you know, has been there through this whole process <laughs> is cool dogs just sitting there like yeah. mom we good like i yeah, i got she's you cool i got you she's the best she's really awesome so when you're coming up you're doing that and you're saying that you know, playing an asian family is so foreign that they have to go out there and, and find people to do it. it speaks to the fact that there were not people in those positions that you could look to and pattern yourself after no no so if that's the case, have you kind of owned the fact that you are that, you know, for other people yes. and, and that role that you yes. play? And it's great. And that's my greatest achievement, because I, I think like the fact that I was out there for a whole generation for of Asian American comedians to see and see that it was possible is really what's amazing. So people like Bo and Yang and Joel Kim Booster and Ali Wong and Sherry Cola and Aquafina and Ronnie Chang and all of these wonderful people who are the best of the best comedians now always credit me with saying I did it because I saw her doing it, you know, um, and I'm so grateful for that. And I'm always hitting them up for jobs. <laughs> I'm constantly asking them for favors. You got to get me in this show. You got to get me on this movie, please, please. Right. Because I, you know, I'm right in those coattails to the very end. Look, I you, love these kids. They're the best. You help build the coattails. I feel like you get to ride them a little bit. I love them. You yeah. know, they go out there talking about you paved the way for me. Like, I, yeah. you're welcome. Now, when's the next movie <laughs> that, that we're doing together? I get to be on. I love it. Ah. We just recently had Joe Coy on with us talking about that responsibility once you start kind of helping open those doors and, and being someone else that people can, uh, can look to. Is that something that's a pleasure to do or does it create an, you know, an additional, like I have to carry this, this torch? Oh, it's a pleasure. It's wonderful to have this history and this length of time 
with this in- industry, which is so all encompassing. It's been such a great journey and I, I welcome it all. I appreciate you taking this much time and I appreciate your dog for allowing us to have this much time <laughs> with you. Um, she's giving you a signal like, you know, I need to go go outside. <laughs> yeah, yeah. She's, she's like, yo, you said 30 minutes, wrap this up. We're at 25. So I'm taking the cue. Um, you also decide, you share all of, of your successes, challenges, obstacles, you know, encouragement while on stage. You've also done books, kind of very open about your experience. Like, why? Like, why share the hard parts? And we haven't gone deep into them, but, you know, personal traumas and things. Why, why put that out there, too? Well, to me, that's what makes life interesting. You know, I think that's what makes life worth examining, too. You know, you want to hear from artists about what their struggles have been. I always do. That's what I always look for in autobiographies or, you know, when I look for people's story, like I want to hear the hard parts. And I think everybody appreciates that. I like to tell them because I think, oh, if somebody can gain something from that, you know, I'm somebody who lives with depression and anxiety and a degree of pretty severe mental illness that I've been able to overcome. So I think that when I'm able to bring that and understand that help, help, I, I help others because my art helps me mm-hmm. and hearing from others about this is, is helpful too. So sharing about it is helpful. So I, I appreciate being able to talk about that. What's the dog's name? Lucia Caterina. Okay. Lucia Caterina? Yes. This is the last question, and you can have mommy back. Uh, we ask everybody on the pulse, what does use your voice for good mean to you? Use your voice for good means to me to tell your truth, whatever that is, and it will help somebody else. And, you know, put your voice out there. And tell us how you're feeling about whatever's going on, because having more voices in the mix is so important. And, you know, I want to hear it. Everybody needs to hear it from you. Thanks so much for watching another episode of The Pulse today with comedian and actor and activist and author Margaret Cho. And she really does an amazing job of kind of sharing her journey and how it has impacted lives and impacted her own life, catharsis, but also entertainment. I enjoyed it. I say that a lot, but it's true a lot. And I hope that you did as well. You can hear the entire podcast. All Places podcasts are available. Just hit like, subscribe, download, wherever you get your podcast. And also, we are streaming. So connected TV folks, folks on streaming TV, Apple TV, Roku, you know the drill. Make sure you download the Fox Local app, and then all of the Pulse episodes are right there at your fingertips. You can always hit me up on social at Bill A. Fox 29 Coming up on the Pulse, just a good guy and an international star. Hey, this is Craig David, and I'll be coming up on the Pulse with the main man, Bill Anderson. It's going to be a nice chat, man. Very good vibes. Are you happy that you're sharing those stories? Yeah, man. It, it, it feels like it was cathartic to to write things that were just emotions that were never really got dealt with. And as soon as you 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 put that down, pen into paper, it's like you're 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 owning it and seeing it for what it really is. And it brought up a, a myriad of, inf- of, of emotions for me that I'd put underneath the rug. And I leave you today as I always do, reminding you whenever you can to use your voice for good and have a good one. Bye.